our um, second instalment of our seminar series. Um, I'd like to start uh, by acknowledging the country that we're meeting on today. Māni nā lū tāpanti, nā lū gāna, yatanga, imparenti. We acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Ghana people and we acknowledge and respect the connection that they hold with their land, waters and communities. And we pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and feel always very privileged to work with um, the people and the elders and the young people um, of our Ghana community. And I know that many of you would have that um, privilege as well. So, yes, today we're talking about how restoring urban ecosystems improves our health um, with Associate Professor Martin Breed. Um, so the way that um, the session works is we are recording today and um, this will be available on our YouTube channel. If you missed our first session on biodiversity sensitive urban design, that one is up on our channel and we'll be sending you the links to all of those afterwards. Uh, you're invited to ask questions at any time and um, pop them into the chat and we will answer as many of these as we can in the session. Um, so we've just got an hour session today and we like to keep it short, sharp and shiny and get you all out the door and home to your families and um, out into the beautiful um, day that it is here in Adelaide um, at five o'clock. So if we don't get to all your questions, rest assured that we'll try and answer them through emails um, and other contacts. While there are many benefits of supporting threatened flora and fauna, um, and they're at the forefront of our minds, we know it's important to recognise the very real impacts on our own health that come from exposure to biodiverse ecosystems. Um, so when we think about the current um, greening strategy that Green Adelaide is working on with many of you, um, we can gather wider support and work with more paths partners when we understand the ways that this will not only help to cool our city and reduce heat island effect and support our native fauna, but it will also have the capacity to improve the physical and mental health of our communities. Um, so Green Adelaide is, um, as many of you know, um, supported the Adelaide National Park City movement, which encourages everybody everywhere to have um, some nature connection. And that really links into this opportunity um, to really highlight the importance of everything that we do in our backyards, schools, parks and beyond. Um, and we're also part of the governance team for the Department of Health, Healthy Parks and Healthy People Strategy, um, which is a good one to, to look up. And th today's talk is particularly relevant to their focus area seven, which is biodiversity, conservation and human health. Um, this focus area is in recognition of some growing evidence, which we'll look at today, that demonstrates how environmental biodiversity, human health and well-being are linked in direct and indirect ways. So while we know that people depend directly on healthy ecosystems in their daily lives for things like the production of food, medicines, timber, fuel and fibre, what is less known is how exposure to diverse natural habitats is critical to developing a healthy microbiome. And actually, I did want to highlight to everyone that um, talking about microbiomes today um, with Martin is that the formidable vegetable band that people may know have know of from permaculture circles, their new album is actually called Microbiome. So if we were a little bit more prepared, we could have had some music to go with today's session. So um, encourage you to check that out. I haven't yet. Um, so, um, yeah, so looking at a healthy microbiome and all, all the possible links with um, reducing um, mortality, improving cardiac health and mental health um, and the health of our babies and young people. So thank you again for joining us today. We believe understanding the connections between biodiversity and health can strengthen partnerships and projects across sectors and really highlight the importance of everything that we do. Um, so, yes, we've got 40 minutes with um, Martin and then we've got 15 minutes for questions at the end. And as I said, please pop them in the chat and we'll collate them um, and then I'll just close for the day. So thanks to Martin. He's uh, an associate professor at the College of Science and Engineering at Flinders University and he's a scholar in restoration ecology, ecosystem health. Um, some career highlights include working with the UN and World Health Organization on the links between biodiversity and human health via the microbiome um, and serving as a patron for the IUCN Species Survival Commission. So he runs a close knit research group that develops solutions to some of our pressing global environmental and societal issues. 
Um, Martin is a passionate university educator and science communicator who I've been wanting to hear from a little bit more, so I'm very stoked to have him here today, who aims to enable the next generation to turn around the global environmental tide from decline and degradation to repair and restoration. And I love that comparison. So thanks for joining us today, Martin, and over to you. Uh, thanks I'll very much, Christy. Sharing. Fantastic. Uh, thanks so much for the warm welcome and hello, everybody. I'll uh, just pop my slides up here and I'll start, but absolutely reiterate all the messages there. If you do have questions, I think while I'm presenting, I probably can't see the chat, but uh, I can see uh, some of the videos. So please raise a hand if you do have any questions or interject uh, however it is best. So uh, can everyone see my screen? OK. Uh, Yes. Get my laser pointer out. Awesome. Thanks. I better get started. So uh, it's wonderful to be here. And I think this is such an important but also fascinating area uh, that I do like talking about. So I hope I won't take up any more uh, time than the, the allocated time so we can have plenty of Q&A and discussion. So where do we start? Well, we've already had a, a, an acknowledgement of country, but I'll do another one, I think, because I do live and work on Ghana land and do acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging and really want to provide a bit of a stepping stone. And I'm going to start my talk with not quite the beginning of time from an Aboriginal Australian perspective, but urbanisation. So we need a terms of reference. Urbanisation, a growing issue is the title I've given this slide. So there's a really cool graphic and you can jump onto this website and actually check out this where what it does, and I've just got a few time slices here. You can see the date, 2,500 BC, and marked down are all the urban centres uh, going through time. So here we are, 500 BC, 500 AD, and we're getting this expansion, of course, as many of us have read about the, the sort of uh, guns, germs and steel latitudinal expansion away from the Fertile Crescent. And if we uh, scan forward now, here we are at 1,900 AD, Adelaide's on the map, but you can see we really are an urban species. And in fact, so this is just a, a cool graphic. Let's look at some data. I'm a data scientist. And so this has years along the X axis and the number of people in billions on the Y. And you can see this crossover mark here between the red and the blue curve at around about, where's that, 2007. So for the first time in human history, there's more people living in urban centres than rural centres for the first time ever for our species. And there are some forecasts. So if we project forward to 2050 now, just look at the expanse here where by about 2050, we're looking at approximately 70% of our species being located in urban centres. And that, again, is unprecedented. And that presents real challenges but I think also real opportunities. And I want to tackle some of those for the remainder of my talk. What does it look like? So here, this was actually taken out of a, um, a window of a plane. I was landing in Sao Paulo. And what you can see is this, this massive expanse of a city. So this is a city, obviously, of many, many millions of people. And you can see maybe patches of forest, perhaps, running along some of these arterial road corridors, maybe something over here, patches of vegetation. But really, cities present a unique challenge to the earth. And here's the sum dot point. So what is urbanisation? This is the, the concentration of people in urban areas, results in changes in land cover, changing vegetation to buildings. And it's got this direct city footprint, but also indirect impacts. So for my talk, I'm really going to focus on the direct impacts. This is the city's footprint and the people that live in the city because these indirect footprints, you know, the trade, energy, tourism, et cetera, are really just, um, they're very big and complex and broad, and I don't really want to focus on those at this point in time. So there's one terms of reference. We're the most urbanised we've ever been, and we're going to become more urbanised going forward. So what does this mean for biodiversity? So the, the, the variety of life out there. Well, there's been a number of studies that have that have done this, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm an academic, so I like peer-reviewed literature and evidence. So if we look at vertebrates, so the number of vertebrate species in urban centres tends to decline across uh, the lowest to the most urbanised centres around the world. 
Invertebrates show the same pattern, so there tends to be a reduction in the number of different invertebrate species. And we've probably heard a lot about this. We've got changes in bird communities in our cities. We've got changes in invertebrate communities and the, the loss of a lot of pollinators. But interestingly, plants, actually, there tends to be an increase in species richness with urbanisation. And this is a bit of a curious one, and I'll, I'll probably just cut to the chase. So why? Well, I will just, just walk through these three points. So when we build our cities, there's this local city effect. So we are displacing species, displacing plants, displacing habitats for us. People actually tend to settle in more biodiverse areas. So there's this regional effect. There's no, it's not random where we've established our urban centres. It's where probably other species would also like to live as well. So these tend to have, you know, uh, rivers and fresh water, access to a diversity of climates, and Adelaide's a really good example. So we're nestled here on the Adelaide Plains, uh, moving up into uh, some of the foothills and up to the top of the lofties. So we didn't have Adelaide settled at, at you know, Murray Bridge or uh, Port Augusta, probably because of some of these regional biodiversity gains or some of the gains provided by things like freshwater that support high levels of biodiversity. But about plants, why might there be an increase in species of plants? Well, that's this introduction. So I have a backyard and I am bringing in plants from a diversity of locations and putting them in my garden. So that leads to increases in plant species in urban areas. There are some other impacts. So vegetation cover gets impacted by cities. We saw that in the photo from Sao Paulo. This is an image of Moscow. We can clearly see city rather than vegetation. And some data from Australia, and I think many of us have seen these sorts of reports. So we know, and in fact, this is a bit old now, we know that the urban canopy coverage is declining in all of the major centres in Australia. And there's been some recent reporting on this in certain suburbs of, of Adelaide. That shows some concerning trends. So there's a lot of attention focused on changes in, um, in vegetation cover, in, in canopy cover in certain suburbs of Adelaide in particular. But what else does it do? So I'm going to talk about the microbiome as was described uh, earlier in the introduction. And it's a bit technical, but I'll just talk about a very new paper, it was in 2021, a very big important paper for those that are interested in soil microbiomes and in fact, urban soils have more soil microbial diversity than soils in national parks. So there's something going on there that links to us and our urban centres and soils. In fact, and I can walk through these graphs if we wish. So th this first graph here is basically comparing around the world, and I didn't show the map, but they've got a map in their study. This dot here shows that there's significantly more bacterial species in urban soils compared to natural ecosystems. However, soils in urban centres to be tend to be generally homogenised. So what that means is the number of species is higher, but they all tend to be more similar. So that's what's shown here. So the number of uh, uh, the dots here represent um, how similar these dot, uh, the, the bacterial communities are in urban green spaces, and they all tend to be significantly more similar to each other across these urban green spaces compared to a diversity of natural ecosystems. So that again is really interesting. So there's this human footprint, not only on the birds, the animals, the invertebrates, the plants, but also the microbes. So we'll turn to soil microbes in a tick. So here we are, we're more urbanised than we ever have been in the past. We've got a significant footprint on our biodiversity. What does it mean to our health? So biodiversity is linked to human health. And this isn't new. This has been talked about by the World Health Organisation. Here is one of their timelines since at least 2012. And so what they're doing now, if we look forward, is drafting what, I, what they have here, a global plan of action on how best to manage, incorporate, appreciate biodiversity from a human health perspective. And for anyone who's particularly interested in this knowledge, 
Uh, I uh, would strongly recommend you read the 2015 State of Knowledge Review on Biodiversity and Health, which was published by the World Health Organization and went through the state of knowledge, the state of play as for why biodiversity is linked to human health, at least given the knowledge available then, some of the general trends and some of the forecasted patterns going forward. And they come up with some really cool and useful infographics like this. So this is published by the World Health Organization. And here we have human health, uh, sorry, biodiversity at the base. This is the root mass of health outcomes. So it's one of the uh, components of, uh, of the world that the World Health Organization is putting at the base of health outcomes. And there's multiple ecosystem services, multiple uh, parts of biodiversity that has uh, that have very clear roles to play in explaining why biodiversity supports our health and how we can best manage that going forward. But again, the World Health Organization wasn't first. I would imagine there would be people on uh, the session today who have probably heard the, of the Healthy Cities Movement. This is from the 1980s. And so I'll just highlight it here. We can see in green, the Healthy Cities Movement called for some key features of healthy cities being clean, safe, with a high quality environment stable ecosystems, skipping down, encouraging connections with the past, including biological heritage. And there are a couple of other points here. But interestingly, Healthy Cities on Kapringa was a signatory to this Healthy Cities movement, and they're active today. And so basically, we've, as the you know, greater metropolitan Adelaide, the, the footprint of Green Adelaide, it's got a direct connection with the Healthy Cities, healthy cities movement from the 80s through the cities. Uh, city of Onkapringa. So why might we be linked to biodiversity? Why might our health be supported by it? Well, there's a very famous recently passed ecologist called uh, E.O. Wilson who talked about biophilia. So the biophilia hypothesis talks about humans possessing this innate tendency to seek connections with nature and other forms of life. And he suggested here that, well, there's some potential evolutionary reasons why we would benefit from this tendency to seek out nature. So this is how we acquire nutrients, materials for shelter. So these are some of the very fundamentals of being a healthy person living in a healthy community and civilization. And was stated back in the 80s, there was the support for this was was shown through links between exposure to environments like green space, biodiversity, et cetera, and enhanced physical and psychological well-being. So what do we know? This is now skipping forward some of my work where we've surveyed the literature in a systematic way and identified a number of modes of action, a number of pathways, how biodiversity can influence our health. And so we derive these pathways through looking at the literature that links green space and human health. And there's a lot more literature on green space and health and le far less on biodiversity and human health. But the green space literature provided us a really nice framework to talk about this. And one of the areas where we then asked, was there a biodiversity and health link was the psychological benefit. So there's moderate evidence that biodiversity supports psychological health outcomes. So one of these areas was through stress reduction. So there's a number of studies, including humans in these studies, to show this. And there are potential social cohesion benefits, so bringing people together into communities, although there's no evidence yet um, available for biodiversity benefits. Physical activity, so there are lots of studies linking uh, access to green space and going out and doing exercise, but again, there's not direct evidence that it's linked to biodiversity yet. And environmental buffering, so there's sort of heat island benefits. And again, there's there's clear links to green spaces, but not necessarily links to biodiversity. However, there's actually very strong evidence of a biological pathway. And I'll oh, put a, a red box around it. This is what I'm going to be talking about for the remainder of this session. So the environment microbiome health axis is the way that we described it. And so here there are human cohort studies, which is very, very strong evidence, and hu uh, animal randomized control trials that show this evidence. So let's talk about some of this evidence very briefly. So what's some of the evidence of these links? So 
higher plant and bird species resistance, so the number of different species of plants and birds, are linked with reduced stress in people. Great. More green space access is associated with decreased numbers of overweight people and increased physical activity. Again, tick. Living in greener areas are associated with improved mental health and social cohesion. Wonderful. Canopy cover causes urban cooling, but in our review, we couldn't find many direct health outcomes. But there are other studies that link heat exposure and negative health outcomes. So a lot of these uh, studies would directly support the uh, well, Green Adelaide's mission to create a greener, cooler city, but also a more diverse city. And so this was the, the human study I mentioned before to do with the environment microbiome axis. So here, biodiversity was brought into daycare centres in Finland and caused an increase in skin microbiota diversity and improved the immunoregulation of the children. So this was the, um, the abstract, the graphical abstract that the, the study used. And it's remarkable. So what they did was basically organise a number of daycare, um, sort of what they call standard daycare um, centres, to actually undertake an experiment where they brought in parts of the forest, which might be a little bit unusual for us based in Adelaide, but very common up in the Scandinavian countries like in Finland. So things like pine forest, uh, plants, heat, etc. these sorts of uh, parts of the forest were brought into these daycare centres under an intervention. And the children were then tracked. And the studies are, I would say, absolutely remarkable, but also very strong in their evidence to show increases in the diversity of microbes, so bacteria, fungi, uh, and many other uh, microscopic beasties on the skin of these children, but importantly, changed the immunoregulation of the children as well. So it showed the children were... Uh, showing less signs of immuno, uh, or immune system dysfunction. And then shifting towards then some of my own work. So we're talking about ecosystem restoration, and I'm a restoration ecologist, so I'm interested in the science of rebuilding ecosystems, which are functional, self-sustaining, have a diversity of native plants and animals, but also a diversity of microbes in the soil. So this was a, a story written up in Australian Geographic called The Good Earth. And check out the subtitle. So there's a growing mound of evidence, nice pun, that spending time in a habitat with healthy soil can be very good for you. And so here, I'm going to unpack some of this. Where do we start? Well, let's start with understanding environmental microbiomes. So we've all probably heard of the microbiome, and these are uh, buzzwords, but they're also technical, there's also a technical definition of a microbiome and happy to answer that question if we want to get into it. But there are also some really important fundamentals to go through. So as a human, we're only 43% human cell for cell. So if you count all the cells in our body and somehow squish us up and count them all, 57% of the cells you get out of us are microbial. And we get all of these cells from our environment. So that's also using a technical definition of the environment. So the way that we are born, we inherit microbes from, uh, sorry, we don't inherit microbes from our, our mother. We get passed on the microbes from our mother the way that we are born, whether we are breastfed or not, our exposure of it as a child, whether we have pets, siblings, access to outdoor spaces. These are all very important in shaping the, the assembly of microbes in us and on us. So what does this microbiome do? Well, our microbiome has direct impacts on basic bodily functions like immunity. It also changes the way that we develop. So the way that our brain functions and the way that our brain develops. It's linked to um, pretty much any disease people have looked at has a microbiome signature. And some of the strongest evidence is for some gut diseases like inflammatory bowel disease. And there's a very, very strong and very well organized uh, research group in Adelaide that's doing amazing work on fecal microbiota transplants. That's probably some of the best in the world at doing that. But also mental health disorders like anxiety and depression have also got uh, microbiome links and not only gut microbiome because we have microbes everywhere, all over us, on our skin, in uh, every place that people have looked. 
Interestingly, our microbiome also shapes our behaviour. So things like our cravings or whether we're irritable or not, these have a microbiome signature. And I think I have time just to tell a brief anecdote, I hope, and that is I was once visiting this lab, the APC Microbiome Institute in Cork, and one of the anecdotes that I got shared there was going on a bit of a broccoli binge, eat broccoli for a couple of weeks every day, and then stop. And then do a little experiment on yourself by going to the supermarket and walking through the green grocer aisle and watch yourself become enamored by this green leafy flower in the vegetable aisles, which is the broccoli. And that is probably because the microbes in our gut are being starved with their broccoli and they're hijacking our, our neural system to change our behavior and making us crave for broccoli. Obviously, it's a bit of a fun example, but that craving is also linked to addictions. So that's what the microbiome in a very brief way does for us. But environmental bi microbiomes are also extremely important and I would say fundamental for ecosystems. So this is just one very complex figure on the right hand side, but really the key points are it's extremely biodiverse. If you get one teaspoon of soil, I'm on the Flinders Uni Bedford Park campus. If I walk out the back and go to the grassy grey box ecological community, grab some soil, do some lab work on it, I will find literally thousands of species of bacteria, of fungi and many other microbes in that soil. It's also fundamental to cycling nutrients. So the way that plants access nitrogen, phosphorus, is linked to microbes in the soil. These soil microbes undertake some of the most fundamental processes that we rely on for everyday purposes, like clean air and available um, nutrients for plants that we rely on. They create soil. They form all sorts of symbiotic relationships with animals and plants. So environmental microbiomes are fundamental to healthy ecosystems. But remember, as I mentioned before, they're also highly impacted by urbanization. So quick rehash, remember, yes, they're very biodiverse in urban centers, but they're also relatively similar. Sip of water and then get onto some specific studies. So what do we know about these urban microbiomes? So these microbes actually go into the air so if you if you dig down in the soil and set up experimental apparatus like this, so this was a, a study done by uh, a colleague of mine, Jake Robinson, who's just published a book called Microbial, uh, sorry, um, oh God, I've forgotten the name of his book. Uh, Invisible Friends is the name of his book. Anyway, he looked at the microbes in the soil and whether they got aerated. So going up to two meters, so above the height of me, down to a meter, half a meter and at ground level. He studied the microbes that were becoming aerated from the soil up into the air column. And this is my lab tech, Christian, and he was helping an honor student actually survey the airborne microbes in sports fields around Adelaide and wanted to understand what the influence of surrounding plant diversity was on the airborne microbes on these sport fields. So if you were playing soccer or football in these areas, what were you getting bombarded with? And did that actually get impacted by the vegetation surrounding you? And so going back to Jake Robinson's study, what he showed was uh, this is diversity of microbes. The diversity of microbes in the soil was absolutely higher than that in the air, but the microbes in the air close to the ground was significantly higher than the microbes higher up off the ground. This is really important. So if you're a child or if you spend lots of time rolling around, perhaps wrestling a two-year-old like I've got at home, you're getting exposed to significantly greater diversity of soil microbes than you are if I was just walking around in that same area. And that's got real implications for our microbiome. And so this is all, I guess, techno jargon, but I'll unpack it a little bit because we actually have shown that you get colonized by these microbiomes when you go out into green spaces. So these complicated sort of scatter plots is exactly what it shows. So uh, these four colored dots are people, these are not people, but basically what it shows is, as is shown over here, before somebody goes out into an urban green space, they have lower diversity of skin 
and nose microbiome than after. So after you go out into these areas, you have substantially higher diversity of microbes bombarding you. So they've actually colonized you. And this wasn't spending hours and hours and hours uh, running around playing sport or doing gardening for the entire day. This was between 15 and 45 minutes of exposure. So it happens quickly and it happens effectively, whether we like it or not. But what does it mean? So I talked about the Finnish study and I it is directly linked to this, but they didn't necessarily really tie their work to biodiversity. And as an ecologist, I'm very interested in this. So we ran a mouse study where we exposed mice in controlled chambers to three different treatments. So either no soil, low soil biodiversity, where there was a low number of different microbial species, and high soil biodiversity. And for reference, these soils were from the Adelaide Hills around Mount Bold Reservoir. And we set up a relatively simple and basic uh, experimental design where we had mice, uh, lab mice, in an enclosure, which was physically separated from the soil treatments, and then had a fan blowing uh, for only a few minutes a day and just dusting these mice with a very small amount of dust in these two treatments, but not in this treatment at all. And this went on for a number of weeks and we then surveyed the behaviour of these mice because we knew that there's a strong link between the microbiome in humans and in mice and their anxiety-like behaviours. So we ran these behaviour tests where mice are observed to be more anxious if they spend all their time around the outside of these boxes and less anxious if they're spending more time in the middle of these mazes. And we looked at their gut microbiome by sur surveying their poo and then associated one with the other and this was a very long and tedious activity because as i mentioned before there are thousands and thousands and thousands of species of bacteria and fungi in the soil and poo environments but we got down to a very very uh, clear signal for one particular bacterial species and i'm going to focus in on that just here so what this graph shows on the x-axis here is the amount, the total amount of this particular bacterium in the faecal samples of these mice. And on this axis is the amount of time these mice were spending in the centre of these mazes. So these were actually the most anxious mice. And we showed that for the most anxious mice, those that were most anxious had the least of this bacterium in their gut. And we did that with a few different statistical uh, lines of evidence, but basically it comes down to some very, very nice interpretation. So we found that this bacterium, which has got a complicated scientific name, appears to moderate the most anxious behaviour uh, in the most anxious mice. So the more of it is in the gut, the less anxious the mice are. So this bacterium is known to produce butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid which is known in many, many other studies to be causatively linked to improved human gut and mental health. So the more of these butyrate producers you have in your body and the more butyrate there is in your gut, the less likely you are to have uh, gut health disorders and a number of other diseases, including mental health disorders. So here we showed in this study a very nice piece of evidence that links exposure and colonisation of these mice to high biodiversity soils and reduced anxiety-like behaviour, but it was modulated by the colonisation of this bacteria. But this bacteria is also quite interesting because it also functions in an anaerobic environment. It's an anaerobic butyrate producer. So anaerobic means it, it functions under environments without oxygen, which are the conditions in a lot of soils. So especially soils that are uh, occasionally inundated with water, those that are uh, um, often in areas where, um, you know, you might get uh, biodiverse woodlands, let's say, down in creeks and in, in gullies. But it's also the type of environment that's in our gut. That's also an anaerobic environment. So it seems plausible, at least, that this bacterium uh, functions and produces butyrate in the environment, plus colonises these mice and produces butyrate in that environment as well. This is really important because it was also most present in the higher biodiversity soils 
And we know through our other work that these sorts of bacteria can be restored. So let's talk about the restoration pathway. So if you're a restoration ecologist and get tasked with uh, understanding whether one has been successful or not, you're probably going to look at the plants. And so these are just uh, images of uh, some forests in Western Australia where restoration has taken place. And the years here indicate how long ago the restoration was done. So here's the reference ecosystem. So this is the system that the, uh, the restoration ecologists were trying to emulate and recreate with their plantings. And if you're a botanist, in fact, even if you're a zoologist and you survey um, a, a, a site that was planted, you know, uh, 30 odd years ago, you won't really be able to discriminate it against those sites that are your reference ecosystem. And as you go closer to now, it looks increasingly dissimilar from the reference ecosystem. So that's the, the sort of bread and butter of a restoration ecologist working in the restoration sector. And these are the microbial data. They're all rather complicated. So one for the science geeks out there. This is a multi-dimensional um, scaling plot, which basically shows in blue multiple samples of reference ecosystems and in increasingly shades of red, more uh, young revegetation sites. And you can see, and I've put an arrow which sort of points in this direction, the older the sites are post reveg, the more similar they are microbially to the reference ecosystem. And we statistically back that up with another mean. So using these, what we call trajectory plots. And so these plots look at similarity of the, the rehabilitation sites to the reference sites. And so with time, the, reference, uh, the, the rehabilitation sites become increasingly microbially similar to the reference sites. That's really cool. In one case study, and we've shown that across multiple studies, not just us, many people, so many people that we did then one of these meta-analyses, which I'm not sure how many scientists there are in the room, but meta-analyses, this provides you pretty good evidence. In fact, it's one of the highest levels of evidence out there. So what this review showed was generally across the world, there's recovery happening in the soil microbiome when you undertake your classical restoration treatment. So when you go out there and tend the native vegetation, you remove the weeds or you replant some native plants, you're probably also influencing the soil microbiome towards a more restored state. That's what our finding here says. And we know, especially because we spend a lot of time looking at the soils in the greater metropolitan um, Adelaide region and the Adelaide Hills, you're more likely also to be restoring soil microbes that are linked to improving our health. So what does this all mean? We could, as scientists, sort of write up our ecology papers and our, our uh, ecosystem health papers and, and uh, put them to one side, or some people say we can bury them in a jar at the top of the garden and forget about them. Or we could try and actually do something about it. So I'm quite passionate about this component. It's actually hoping to make a difference. And I hope there are many, many other groups out there around the world, including other universities in South Australia, plus those around Australia and elsewhere that are doing this work. And I know that there are, and that's very, it makes me feel really good. And so some of the work that is occurring is incorporating this knowledge into medical context. So talking to people about organising green prescriptions, so getting people to go out into nature, get exposed to biodiversity under doctor's orders. And there was a uh, South Australian government run pilot study that finished, I think it was last year, that was exactly that. So I think they called it a nature prescription trial. And the idea there was to get GPs to speak to patients and encourage them or prescribe them time in nature, in addition to all the other um, uh, health recommendations that they were providing. And I think that's really cool that that's actually taking off and it's going around the world. So there are a number of green prescription trials occurring uh, across the globe, not just in Australia. In fact, I think I'd say Australia is a bit of a late adopter in the green prescription uh, trial studies. So New Zealand and Europe are some of the earlier adopting uh, jurisdictions, but not just GPs. So working in with, let's say, designers, architects, can we build the next generation of our urban buildings and our urban communities that bring in microbial biodiversity 
and manage the way that we're exposed to this biodiversity in a way that also looks good, is functional for our daily lives. And so working closely with um, that sector as well, I think, is really important. And uh, there's all sorts of examples. And I, I, I wasn't engaged in the new um, Royal Adelaide Hospital, but I know this, there was significant incorporation of plants into the building and design of that. And I only look at the uh, Bedford Park Flinders Uni campus and I take my students for walks uh, and talk about ecosystem restoration and getting bombarded by all these microbes ah, as we walk around campus because there's some really good woodlands on campus and they're precious and they're really important. So working with the, the sustainability group uh, of Flinders Uni, making sure there's appreciation and care for these very usable and functional areas where classrooms and commuter pathways are orientated. And I think there's so many activities here and I, I, I can't wait for the conversation because I've only got a couple of slides to go to talk about how we can actually realise some of these uh, benefits in our society today. And taking a step back, so uh, obviously very focused on Adelaide, the United Nations is um, we declared the uh, 2021 to 2030, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And this was their press release where they talked about unparalleled opportunities for job creation, food security, and addressing climate change. And I think they're now absolutely incorporating the human health dimension, but I would say maybe they missed a, missed a trick on their press release, but could really take advantage of the human health benefits of engaging in ecosystem restoration. And there's all sorts of reasons why people uh, would benefit directly uh, from a health perspective from engaging with uh, restoration practices themselves, but also the community. There are these, these population wide benefits to be, to be realized as well. And I think that's really um, one of the most fruitful and exciting areas that I hope to work on into the future. So to wrap up, um, instead of thinking about cities like these amazing uh, built landscapes, why don't we look down and think about what's in our parks, what's in our neighbourhood, in our streetways, and what's in the soil, because I think increasingly that's going to be important for us, our families and our communities to make sure that we live in a supportive environment, a sustainable environment that actually supports our health and well-being going forward. So that's the end. Uh, Lots of different organisations and people were involved. It's not just my work. It's a, from a cast of thousands of students and staff, collaborators, friends, colleagues. And these are the formal organisations I'd like to acknowledge, including Green Adelaide. And thank you very much for the time to talk about uh, some of the work that I've done. Have you got any questions? I will stop sharing my screen now, I think. No worries. Thanks so much, um, Martin. There is um, a couple of questions coming in. Um, Oh, um, this one's a good one from Nat. I'll start with that and then jump around. How large an area of biodiversity is needed to improve health? Um, can the biodiversity in your backyard improve health? So at that kind of smaller scale, which I think you uh, alluded to. I did. And look, I guess uh, being a scientist, it always makes me nervous in these discussions, but I'll be bold and start <laughs> answering them as, you know, we probably know enough to to know what to say here. So uh, some of the uh Best available evidence would suggest that actually backyards are more important than public places for our health. So there's stronger links to uh, biodiversity in our backyards and our health outcomes than there is from public uh, biodiversity. And I think that's really important. So yes, backyards are fundamental, but so are the road verges, so are the, uh, the public parks. But if I was going to... Um, I guess, make some general recommendations or speak generally about this, I would think about where the people are because there's a very strong luxury effect. Most biodiversity resides in areas that are wealthier and that's a real problem if you want to support the people that are going to benefit most from a health perspective because those people probably live in the poorer suburbs and poorer suburbs or uh more socioeconomically deprived suburbs tend to have lower biodiversity. So those would be the areas that I would probably spend public purse or public good uh, and public energy, volunteer energy, rather than uh, you know 
don't want to pick on Burnside, but the leafy green in, inside uh, inner east in, in areas like that are probably the areas that have the most biodiversity and are already realising a lot of these gains. So yes, backyards, yes, small, but let's not be too sort of focused on our own terrain. I would also focus on the areas that at least are provide from a social equity perspective. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, where to focus the energies. Um, Chris has got a question here. Um, is there a link between reference ecosystems and health or can constructed landscapes provide the same benefits? Yeah, so reference ecosystems is a, a bit of jargon in the sector of restoration yes. ecology. So these tend to be the most pristine, you know, the, the, the national park type habitats. And yes, there is uh, absolutely uh, strong evidence. So the soils we use for the mouse experiment were from a reference ecosystem. Um, but having said that, we have shown that you can restore or construct also a, a biodiverse soil environment and people would be exposed to those as well. So I don't want to say that every constructed, every restored patch is going to have these sorts of health promoting microbes in it. But I will absolutely say that there is potential uh, to use the ecological principles of restoration ecology to bring back some of those health associated microbes. I think that's a very real possibility that can be done even in very novel environments. And um, there's. Um, uh, I probably shouldn't have mentioned the there's a can of worms called novel ecosystems and these tend to be highly altered from a reference ecosystem state and that also speaks to that social equity concern so I can't see areas that are socially deprived of national parks and reference ecosystems um, achieving a reference ecosystem in the next 10 years it takes a really long time to recover yeah a reference ecosystem like state. So no, I think there is hope for these constructed and novel ecosystems to actually be made in a certain way that has links uh, to uh, or are geared towards promoting health associated biodiversity as much as possible. And I think that's probably the area of research that is most needed. So now that we know there are these general associations, what's next? Well, let's try and make a toolkit. Let's try and make a, uh, a predictive framework so we can do it in a much more targeted way. Mm, yeah, definitely. And I think, yeah, you're right. Some of the it's back to those questions that you had on that slide about, yeah, who and where and why and what for. And so, you know, some, um, yeah, some ecosystems are possible and some are not. And yeah, so we, we have to be adaptable in our pro approach and obviously um, protect the ones that we can. Um, but yeah, the city environment has been so changed that, um, yeah, it's increasingly difficult to, um, yeah, to go back to those um those those ecosystems that existed before. So yeah, um, it's important to always look at our context. Um, I think um, I think this is a great question here. So I'll come back to yours, um, Bruce. But I think we noted on that. But um, would soil microbiomes be rich enough in vertical and elevated spaces as well to to look at links with human health, like mm -hmm. green roofs and green walls? Mm. Uh, I haven't seen many green. So the colour green roofs in Adelaide, we're in a very dry place. So I'd say to achieve a green roof in Adelaide, we'd need a lot of uh, water sensitive urban design integration and hopefully Green Adelaide can provide some guidance on that. But uh, yeah, green walls, green roofs, I would say there's probably not a lot of direct studies uh, to support that. But my recommendation would be yes. Uh, you know, microbes are everywhere. So the saying is mm. in the sort of when you're in the inside of the tent, they say, um, Everything is everywhere, uh, so microbes can move all over the place. However, the studies we showed was the higher off the ground you go, the less diverse um, are the microbes in the air. So if you're on, you know, the 20th floor of the some of the higher high rise buildings, how do you get that exposure up there? And I think that is a real design challenge because mm -hmm. there are real public mm -hmm. health concerns. So Legionella's disease is one of the sort of you know, evaporative air conditioner nightmares. And so I think you'd need to absolutely bring in sort of a, a health protection or, um, you know, environmental health regulatory framework to make sure you do it in the right way because it doesn't come without risks. But yeah, I can't see why certain microbes cannot be inoculated into green roofs or green walls. And I work with people in far you know, lesser environments than Adelaide. And so in yeah. the UK, there's a lot of interest from the landscape architect and landscape design sector in building that link because they're 
No, it doesn't rain every day, but it is significantly easier to create a green roof and a green wall in, you know, Sheffield, where I work closely with people, compared to Adelaide. And so I'd say we need to be careful with our environmental setting. We don't want to be wasting water and diverting energy and resources away from, um, as I said before, those that would benefit most to make a, you know, uh, one small, luxurious, wonderfully health-promoting, health-benefiting uh, area. I think there's a real risk of that. Um, so I'd say yes, but be careful with the environmental resources and the equity issues. Mm, definitely. And I think I think you started to answer um, Sharon's question <laughs> before. Um, do studies find any um, difference in resulting benefits between native or endemic biodiversity and introduced species? biodiversity we cut you kind of touched on that a bit before i did um, uh thanks sharon i love that question because it's really um i uh, i'd say that's probably one of the most controversial topics in restoration ecology and a lot of urban ecology are uh, invasive species bad uh and I'm probably not going to talk about the ecological pros and cons. I'd say this concept of novel ecosystems is a real hot potato, but we'll say sometimes you're never going to be able to get rid of, let's say, the blackberries from Waterfall Gully or, you know, rabbits from Australia. It's not going to happen. Yes, you can manage them yeah. where you really, really want, but it's going to be really intensive, uh, resource intensive to get rid of something. Uh, and if you look at microbes, uh, to get a little bit technical, not every microbe species functions differently from the next one. So microbes are really weird things. Bacteria can do this thing called horizontal gene transfer. So they can literally pass packages of genetic material between one species and another. And it really throws a big spanner into this concept of species in a microbial sense. So a lot of it is it comes out of functional, uh, functional groups. So I would say no, it probably doesn't matter whether you're talking about locally endemic native species and invasive species, because all plants require nutrients, all plants require water, all plants are going to be interacting with their soil environment. So there's probably species of plants out there that are non-natives that will cultivate a very similar functional microbiome as a native species. The challenge there, of course, is that sort of jigsaw puzzle approach where if you let the blackberries run wild, you'll get a very, very blackberry orientated soil microbiome. And that's going to be very different from the soil microbiome of a, you know, a heathy understory community with, you know, 20, 40 different native plant species. So, and the problem with invasives comes from dominance, where you get one dominant invasive overwhelming uh, a tremendous diversity of plants. But backyards, are really important for our health and most backyard plants generally are not locally native so i think the evidence would fall on uh the fact that it probably it probably doesn't have a massive effect unless the ecosystem falls out of kilter and ends up in a very dominated ecosystem hmm. and that answers uh, a previous question there about how yeah in, so increasing is there any evidence that increasing plant biodiversity in our backyards will significantly significantly increase microbial biodiversity and hence human mm. health i think that's the that's a clear message that's coming is like the more biodiverse the more um uh diversity you have um the better for the for the health of your microbiome and one of the reasons for that because that's absolutely true and one of the reasons for that is because plants can't live without microbes so you need this yeah you need this this ecosystem this below ground ecosystem to form and function so, yeah, you, uh, diversity generally is good. Awesome. Um, oh, that's an interesting one. I think that's going outside of your research area, that last question, but um, I'll, I'll say it out loud for everyone to hear. Um, given that there is a high volume of green space and biodiversity in more affluent areas, have you been able to tease out or factor in other determinants to health and well-being, such as access to health services that lower socioeconomic area occupants may have, yeah, inhibited um, access to? Probably outside your research scope, I would say. It is, but we have, you know, uh, read and published a couple of studies in that space. Yes, so, yeah, great. you're absolutely right. Socioeconomic status is the best predictor of health outcomes generally. And, however, when you control for that, still biodiversity comes out in the top five so if you look at mm. the number of different plant species out there in respiratory health so um uh, uh, one of my my postdocs wrote, published a study a few years ago that looked at that and that was absolutely what he found he found um 
socioeconomic status is always probably going to fall out top as far as health outcomes is concerned. But in the top five, we're multiple biodiversity or environmental um, parameters as well. So controlling for socioeconomic status, yes, uh, still biodiversity has a role to play. Yeah, great. That, it would be great if you could share that um, paper, Martin, and we can yeah share that with others if they're mm -hmm. keen to dig into that that area a bit more as well. Because yeah, it'd be great to keep showing all those links. Now, I think I've I think I've got everyone's questions in there. So um, yeah, thank you everyone for um, joining in the discussion. And so yeah, someone said thanks for mes mentioning novel ecosystems. Bold and creative is the way forward. So if you haven't haven't heard of novel ecosystems, there's um there's some um yeah great YouTube um videos and links and research out there as well um to uh to jump into that. So I love how these yeah these sessions always link you off to further research and um possibilities. So um yeah, thanks so much, Mark. Is there anything you wanted to say before I um, um close? No, I, I guess yes, and that is initiatives like the National Park City are directly in line with a better understanding and a better better way of grasping all the reasons why we should be caring for nature. And yes, caring for nature for nature's sake is really important, but it's also really important for our own sake. And I, I, I care deeply about that and um, am absolutely uh, overjoyed that that kind of spotlight can be shone on the um, the city of Adelaide and I think Green Adelaide does a fantastic job at communicating that among many other initiatives they have and also many other organisations so uh, I'd say get out there and be passionate and make sure that uh, it, you know recommendations are evidence-based obviously but we do know enough to act now and I think that's hopefully some of the messages that I've got across today can help that. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Martin. And yeah, thanks for enthusiastically um, yeah, providing all that evidence and some of the heavy science and um, combining that so well in a way that really gives a strong argument to um, to to that whole area. And I love I love the thought of um, having these invisible friends that we're um, <laughs> that we're wandering yeah. around with and um, mm -hmm. that we're getting bombarded friends on one side and then we're getting bombarded by microbiomes as well. Um, and that it can happen in a really quick quick way as well. I think that's really encouraging um, for all of us that are working and um, living on the planet today. So thank you so much to everyone for joining in and Martin for your time and all the, all the work that you're doing. Um, we will send a follow-up email with relevant links out to everybody and references. And if you've got any further questions or feedback on these sessions, please, yeah, please do send it through to us. Uh, we encourage you to join the Green Adelaide mailing list to receive our monthly newsletter and stay up to date with the sessions that are coming up. Next month's session is looking after Adelaide's waterways. Um, and that one's going to be on Thursday, April 6th. Um, so this session is particularly targeted to our council partners, but is open to anyone um, of interest. So we're going to be looking at really why looking after waterways is important, what Green Adelaide is doing and what the responsibility of land owners, including state government, local councils, businesses and individuals actually are. So we'll be covering off, you know, all of those situations where you might need a, a permit um, and then some of the workshops and guidelines. And my favourite acronym of all, the BPOP, so Best Practice Operating Procedure, um, which is a procedure that councils have to follow um, and um, why, why you need to jump into those. So, yeah, Best Acronym Award goes to them. So, yeah, please join us. For, for those sessions and for future ones um, and please share with your networks um, that this will be available online. Thank you so much. We finished at five on the dot. Yay. See you next time. See you all.